Hey everybody, we're back for chapter four of civics. So let's go ahead and get into it. The standard we're going to be talking about tonight is standard number 10. Describe individual and civic responsibilities of citizens of the United States. The objectives for this chapter are discuss the First Amendment, evaluate the Bill of Rights, and examine other notable amendments. And so these are going to be the three, amendment, the three objectives we're going to talk about. The biggest threat to the Constitution was an absence of the Bill of Rights. Remember, the Anti-Federalists said, we're not going to sign this unless you add a Bill of Rights because we want to make sure that our rights are protected. The Bill of Rights protected our civil liberties, which is the freedom we have to think and act without government influence. And the First Amendment of the Constitution protects five basic freedoms. So let's talk about those briefly. Freedom of religion allows you to worship any way that you want to as long as it doesn't infringe on the rights of others. It also makes sure that the government doesn't establish a nationwide religion and that they don't make laws against certain religions. That being said, there are limitations. Like, for example, if your religion teaches violence against other people, that's not going to be tolerated by the First Amendment. You can't say, well, it's my First Amendment right because my, my religion teaches that I need to do this, you know. And so it doesn't protect you from violence against other religions or anything like that. Freedom of speech gives you the right to say what you want to, dress how you want to, listen to the music you want to, things like that. But at the same time, there are also limitations on this as well. The story that usually goes along with this is that you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. And you say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, if you're in a movie theater and it's crowded, and even if it's not crowded, it's not a good idea. But if you yell fire and everybody takes off running and someone gets trampled and gets really bad injured or killed, when the police get there and start doing an investigation, they're going to question you about why did you yell that there was no fire. And a uh, good chance you're going to be facing criminal charges because of that, because you started a riot you started a frenzy a panic uh, because of the things that you said so you're not always you know it's also you know if you threaten somebody if you tell somebody they you know something bad or whatever that can be used against you so yes you have freedom of speech but it's limited when it's causing criminal activity or, or people want to be harmed Freedom of the press allows the you to write things without fear of persecution from the government because, you know, people write every single day bad things about President Trump, just like they wrote bad things about President Obama, uh, President Bush, uh, President Clinton. You know, they've always wrote bad things about the president. And you're protected to do so because they knew that under King George III, if they would have wrote King George III is off his rocker or crazy or something like that, then King George III could have had him put in jail or killed. And they didn't want that, so that we have freedom of the press. Freedom of assembly is where you can get together. If you and your friends want to get together and, and you know hang out at the, the park in Phil Campbell, that's completely fine as long as you know it's okay for you to do that at the time. Like right now it's closed because of you know, the stay-at-home order. But if you want to go to the park and hang out, that's fine. But if you're up there meeting to plan an illegal activity or you're, if you're engaging in illegal activity there, that's not protected. And freedom of petition the government. You can protest the government. You can petition the government as long as there's no violence involved. If, you, if you're holding up signs, <clears throat> if you're holding up signs that says, you know, we want change and you know, you're protesting something, that's, that's 100% legal. If you're holding up signs saying, you know, we're going to attack the mayor's house or we're going to, you know, bust the windows out of City Hall or something. That's not petitioning the government. That becomes a riot, becomes a crime when you start doing things like that. You can protest, you can petition the government. You cannot start riots and do damage. The Supreme Court decided that compelling public interest, which is the safety and security of Americans, may justify a limitation to the First Amendment, basically saying if your rights is going to lead to criminal action, as the second thing says, or if it interferes with the rights of others, as the third thing says, then you no longer have that right. And so that's kind of the idea here is if it's 
If it's leading to criminal action or if it's interfering with the rights of others, that limits your rights. Let's just briefly look at this list of the other nine of the Bill of Rights. Second Amendment, of course, is uh, protecting the right to bear arms. The Third Amendment, no quartering of soldiers during peacetime in private homes without consent. Now, of course, during wartime, Congress would have to approve this. It's not like, okay, we're at war, soldiers can quarter at your home. You know, it's going to have to be approved by Congress. Number four, right to be uh, secure in your prosperity or in your property. It's getting late. Uh, you're in your property in person against unreasonable search or seizure. So if they decide they want to search your home and take something from your house, they have to go through the proper precautions and the proper procedures. They can't just do it. They've got to go through the, the right channels. Now, Fifth Amendment, this is where you have to be indicted by a grand jury. Uh, this protects you against double jeopardy or being charged for the same crime twice. And self-incrimination, due process, and eminent domain. So you can't, you know, it, it gives you the right to not incriminate yourself. It gives you the right to have the due process or the legal process to go through the, the right channels and protects your eminent domain, which is, uh, you know, the government has the right to come in and, and take your property and pay you for it in return, you know, to build something there that needs to be there. That's not in behind eminent domain. Number six is the criminal procedure. It gives you a speedy and, and public trial, an impartial jury. Uh, number seven, this is a civil procedure, jury trial according to the rules of common law. This is where you can sue people over $20. <coughs> Excuse me. My sinuses are bothering me. The Eighth Amendment. No excessive bill or fine, no cruel or usual punishment. You can't torture people. You know, you can't take them somewhere and beat them until they tell you the information that you want. You know, that's not part of it. The Ninth Amendment, rights not enumerated, belong to the people. That means even not listed in these rights, you may still have a right to. You have a right to your uh, privacy. That's usually something that's explained with the Ninth Amendment. The 10th Amendment, any power not given to the United States or the federal government will fall to the states, and the states can decide those things. The Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th Amendment allowed slavery, outlawed slavery in the United States and outlawed any forced slavery except as punishment of a crime. So this is the reason why that people that are inmates, a lot of times they have outside picking up garbage and things like that. That's part of their punishment. It's part of them going through the proper channels. Uh, but it outlawed slavery, the 13th Amendment did. It got rid of it. The 14th Amendment defined a U.S. citizen as anyone born or naturalized in the United States. Now, remember we talked about this, that if you're born in the U.S., that's a given. You're a U.S. citizen. But if you're naturalized, you have to go through the proper procedures. You have to, uh, you used to have to declare your intent. You have to go through the process of living in, in the United States for a certain amount of time. You have to go through the process of taking classes and taking a test. You got to go for an interview. You have to do all these different things to get to the point where you can become a legalized citizen. Now they passed this originally because they this made former slaves U.S. citizens because they were born or naturalized in the U.S. This was enacted because many of the states, after the Thirteenth Amendment, passed black codes to keep African Americans from having certain rights. Now these black codes would limit what they could do. For example. Uh, this is what's going to be the precursor that leads to segregation. It's going to lead to the poll tax. It's going to lead to um, you know, different things that's going to try to keep African Americans down after the Civil War. And so that's why the 14th Amendment was passed to, to give African Americans citizenship in case there's any question about it. The 14th Amendment also made it where the government cannot interfere with the privileges or immunities of citizens in the United States. So if you're a citizen, they cannot take away your rights. The incorporation of the 14th Amendment guaranteed the same basic rights to all Americans, no matter about your, your race or nothing. The 15th Amendment states that no state may take a person's voting rights away based on the basis of color, race, or previous enslavement. Now what's missing there? Gender. Because women still have a right to vote. African-American men gained the right to vote before women did. 
Now, just because African-American men gained the right to vote didn't mean they could exercise that right to vote. Uh, we're going to talk in a minute about poll tax. Poll tax is where you have to pay money to go and vote. That was to try and limit African-Americans and former slaves from coming and voting. They also, when the Ku Klux Klan originated, the Klan would stand outside of voting areas and intimidate African-Americans. A lot of times if they saw them going to vote, they would think, okay, they're going to come after me now because they saw me vote. And so that would scare them off or they wouldn't vote. So that was kind of, you know, there was things that was happening. African-American men had the right to vote, but were they always able to utilize that? And the answer is no, because there was things that was trying to keep them from that. Some African-American men did go and vote, but people tried to keep them from doing so. Suffrage is just another word for the right to vote. In practice, it only affected men, so African-American men gained the right to vote before women did. No matter their race, women could not vote. The 17th Amendment passed to give people the right to elect their senators directly. This is what we're going to be doing here in November. There's a Senate race in Alabama, and we're going to go and directly vote for our senator, and that's going to determine who wins. The 19th Amendment guaranteed women the right to vote. Uh, this gave women the right to vote. This is a big deal. Like I said in another video, this is the 100th anniversary. It was 1920 when women gained the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. 96 years after women got the right to vote, Hillary Clinton runs for president as a woman. You know, it's it's a really cool thing to think about that in less than 100 years, we had a woman not only able to vote, but to run for president. And you see that now in Congress, uh, there's more women than there's ever been. The 23rd Amendment allowed the residents of Washington, D.C. to vote. That's just another business type amendment to give the residents of Washington, D.C. the right to vote. The 24th Amendment outlawed the poll tax. Like I said, that was a requirement for voters to pay for casting a ballot, and it was really put in place to limit African Americans from voting. The 26th Amendment made the voting age 18, and this is going on during the Vietnam War. The mentality was if they were old enough to go and fight for our country, they should be able to elect the, that same country's leaders. And so because of that, they lowered the age to 18. So this is where we're going to stop at for this video. Uh, just a few things about it. I want you to look at the list of the stuff we talked about tonight. I hope you took a little bit of notes from this. If you didn't, go back and watch it again. Take some notes. Look at the different amendments that, that affect us. Look at the rights that we have and just reflect on that. Look on that and, and, and ask yourself, okay, well, you know, how would my life be different if the Bill of Rights wasn't here? You know, how would my life be different if the 13th, 14th, 15th, you know, 19th, if these amendments didn't take place, how would my life be different? Think about that. Realize that this plays a really big role in all of our lives, especially in a political year or election year like we're in right now. So, have a great day. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. I miss all my students. I look forward to seeing you soon.